Welcome to our keynote address for today's session. Uh, the theme, of course, of this address is treaty, yesterday, today and tomorrow. And it'll be um, uh, what it will no doubt be an insightful synopsis from uh, across the Tasman, the journey of Te uh, Tariti o Waitangi. Uh, and uh, it's signing the establishment, of course, of the Wai Tangi Tribunal to address grievances and, and also talking about how the, the, the principles of partnership, participation and protection are being addressed for uh, today and uh, the children of tomorrow. Now, taking us through all of these themes is our distinguished speaker, the Honourable Justice Sir Joe Williams, KNZM. If you haven't read his bio yet, here is just a snapshot. He, I'm told, apparently fell into law at the Victoria University in Wellington and then went on to gain uh, his honours in law from the University of British Columbia before becoming a partner at a Wellington law firm. In 1999, Justice Williams became the Chief Judge of the Maori Land Court and was appointed Deputy Chairperson of the Waitangi Tribunal shortly after in 2000 and was made Chairperson of the Tribunal just four years later. Then, in another, in another four years later, he was appointed a Judge of the High Court in New Zealand and a Judge of the Court of Appeal uh, uh, as well sometime later. Then, in 2019, became the first Maori judge of the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court being New Zealand's highest court, the equivalent to our High Court uh, in Canberra. And in the 2020 New Year Honours, he was appointed a Knight Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for Services to the Judiciary and brings a unique blend of legal, intellectual ringer and tikanga Maori practices and values to his role. His iwi affiliations are Nati Pukinga, Waitaha, and Ta Tapi Ika. Apologies, uh, Justice Williams, um, because I have no doubt you could do a much better job at pronouncing those iwi uh, than, than I just did there. It's a privilege to be able to, to share this conference with you and to hear from uh, you today. Uh, over to you to, uh, to provoke uh, some thoughts amongst all of us and inform us all. Well, well uh, tēnā koutou katoa uh, e te iwi e hui hui nei a ki te whakarongo ki e nei kōrero oku kia koutou. Uh, e tangi ake ki te ahua tanga ki o tātou mate uh, i te mea rāho ki ko tātou o rātou rupā. Nō reira tēnā koe te kai pōhiri tēnā tātou katoa. Um, okay, so uh, this is this is a little weird because um, I'm talking to a screen and um, I'm not that good at that. I can't tell uh, who you are I'm talking to, uh, how many of you there are, and most importantly, whether you are uh, laughing, grimacing, or smiling at what I say. So. Uh, You'll just have to bear with me uh, while I um, go through some basic uh, talking points and hopefully they um, strike a chord with you. Um, but uh, I'll try my best. So I want to uh, split these comments up into uh, four parts. If my job is to talk to you about partnerships and how they've developed in Aotearoa, in this country, with uh, Indigenous people, between Indigenous people and the Crown, then um, you need to have some context about the, the modern situation of Māori in New Zealand, uh, some history about the treaty and what happened after 1840 when it was signed, um, then I'm going to give you some partnership discourse as that idea has developed really over the last 30 years, 40 years. Some modern examples in New Zealand of partnerships in operation. And then um, hopefully end on an optimistic note, but we'll see. So um, I'm assuming that the 
bulk of this audience is Australian. I hope that's right. In which case, um, you'll need a bit of a backgrounder. The Māori population is about 16% of New Zealand's population. We have a mixed member proportional representation system, one of the effects of which has been that the Māori representation in the parliament, that is uh, members of parliament of Māori descent, exceeds that 16% proportion of the population. I think it's around 20%, uh, but don't quote me on that. Our cabinet, which, as with your system, is the apex of governmental power, uh, has 26 members, seven of them are Māori, and 11 are, are Pacific Islanders. So um, a little less than a third Māori cabinet ministers, including our members that you've had some coverage of in the past. Uh, our judiciary has one Māori Supreme Court judge, one Māori Court of Appeal judge, one Māori High Court judge, so that's, that's our senior courts. And I'm guessing at this, but I would say about 30 Māori judges in the lower courts, including the chief district court judge, who is Māori, and in charge of about 170 district court judges, so the largest bench in Australasia, as far as I understand it, uh, and the chief Māori land court judge, who is also Māori. I don't know what the public sector figures are, but um, somewhere between, uh, I can identify three off the top of my head, uh, chief executives of government departments who are Māori, but I, I wouldn't rely on that. Three, maybe four or five. And maybe 20 odd deputy chief executives across uh, senior leadership uh, um cohort of maybe 200. So in some sense, the public sector is behind um, the game in terms of Māori and leadership roles compared with the judicial and the political end. So that's um, going to be, I think, that story starkly different to um, the situation you find yourselves in in Australia. Uh, but the negative statistics remain stubbornly negative. Um, Māori comprise more than half of the prison population, and our prison population has just recently fallen from a record high of 10,500. Uh, we imprison at a much higher rate than Australia does. Uh, Māori women imprison in prison, I think a 65%, not quite at 70%, but very high. Uh, the removal of Māori children um, is at an extraordinary high, extraordinarily high rate. Uh, there are about 7,000 care and protection orders, which are removal uh, orders each year and about 70% of those relate to Māori children. More generally, Māori tend to be the least healthy, uh, the least well-educated. They have poor housing. Um, second only, I think from my memory, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, riffing this, I'm afraid, second only to Pacific Islanders in terms of housing um, and poor unemployment, uh, poor employment. So Māori are generally speaking at the bottom of the social and economic pile, even though relatively significant inroads have been made into the structures of power in this country really over the last 10 years. So I think what we're seeing is the, the social uh, 
the social and economic situation lagging behind um, the way in which Māori have come to counter-colonise the structures of public power. All right, so that's that. That's modern context. Let me then talk about the Treaty of Waitangi, um, which tends to provide the framework around which Indigenous issues are discussed in this country. Uh, it was entered into between the Crown and the British Crown and chiefs and tribes of New Zealand, 500 and uh, I should know this off by heart, 39 chiefs signed from throughout the country, including my great 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 grandfather, Te Kourehua, uh, and Captain Hobson on behalf of Her Britannic Majesty uh, Queen Victoria, who hadn't been in the job for long in 1840. Uh, the treaty has three articles, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to quickly skim through the content because I expect that you won't have been told about this. The treaty has three articles, and it is bilingual. So the English text of the treaty reads like a lawyer wrote it. The Māori text of the treaty reads like a Māori wrote it. The effect of that is that they do not speak to the same outcome. And this has been the subject of uh, extensive discussion really over the last 150 years, as you'd imagine. In the English text, the chiefs give up absolute sovereignty to Her Majesty, in return for which the Crown makes two significant guarantees. The first is that their exclusive and undisturbed possession of their lands, forests, fisheries, and such other properties as they may individually or collectively possess shall be guaranteed to them, subject to the Crown's right of preemption over land titles. So basically, a guarantee of Aboriginal title, with the Crown having a monopoly of purchase. And secondly, and equally significantly, the guarantee of all the rights and privileges of British subjects, which in 1840 was probably a relatively radical thing to do. Only eight years after the abolition of slavery. Um, so it would have been seen as enlightened for its time. The Māori text doesn't do these things. It transfers to the British Crown the right of kawanatanga. Kawana is a transliteration of governor. So, and the tanga on the end of it means governorship. So you can translate that loosely government, a right of government. The word that's used was used in the Bible, in the early translations of the Bible. A document that the chiefs who signed, in, for the most part, would have become very familiar with over the couple of decades since the missionaries had arrived. The level of Māori literacy in 1840 in Māori was higher than the level of settler literacy in English. And the primary focus of that literacy was, of course, the Bible. So the kawana was the word used to describe Pontius Pilate's position. You get a sense then of what the chiefs might have understood this role to be. Now, in exchange for that, 
the Crown guaranteed a thing called tino rangatiratanga. Now, rangatira is the Māori word for chief. Tanga means chiefship, or you might say authority. Tino, at the front of it, is an intensifier. So every right of the chiefs to govern was protected to those chiefs in exchange for giving up Pontius Pilate's power to the crown. So you can see there's a potential conflict between the transfer of absolute sovereignty in Article 1 of the English text and the protection of basically a self-government right in Article 2 of the Māori text. And there's a great deal of uh, debate and historiography around that, which we don't have time to get into. Um, but there is the conflict, and it is the conflict that played out really for... Uh, for all of the ensuing years, and it remains primarily a conflict today. Who gets to make decisions? For whom? Now, you have to bear in mind that in 1840, there were a few hundred settlers in New Zealand, sorry, a few thousand, 2,000, I think. And a large number of Māori, of course, in a relatively small space compared with Australia, but most importantly, those Māori were armed to the teeth, much better armed than the English. And so uh, even a cursory read of the sources at the time indicates that while change was clearly in the wind, and obviously British power was present in New Zealand, on the ground, the Māoris ran things. And the British to the extent that they exercised any control, did so only by express consent. All right. Oh, and the, uh, the third article in the Māori text was an accurate translation of all the rights and privileges of British subjects. So that bit they got right, but the rest of it was really up for debate. Um, now, so you have this situation where a relationship reflected in a treaty is established in 1840 in recognition of the likelihood that some met level of settlement would continue in the years um, coming forward and that a, a power of the British to manage the British was transferred. Query whether and this is a matter of debate, as I've said, the power to manage the chiefs and the tribes was transferred. That would have, that process would have evolved um, relatively naturally over a longer period were it not for some fairly sharp changes in Britain, including the Irish potato famines, that meant instead of a steady trickle of settlers coming into New Zealand, it was a flood. And by 1858, that's 18 years later, Māori were outnumbered for the first time by settlers. And that's the context within which the wars over land were fought in the 1860s through to the 1880s involving in the first phase of that war, 12,000 Imperial British troops uh, fighting wars in the Waikato area, in the Taranaki area, and later on in the Bay of Plenty and the East Coast with uh, local militia uh, added on later on as the Brits decided the war was costing too much for a place so far away. Uh, and the result of all of that was the confiscation of the lands of the rebel tribes and the individualization of all titles that remained. So over a period of about 30 years, Māori control of the country effectively evaporated. First through war 
and then through much more effectively actually co the colonial machinery of state the introduction of the native land court and the, the confiscation um, implementation plans now so what follows is a hundred years of continuing conflict in some places and cooperation as leaders sought to make the best of uh, what was for them a very bad situation and really across the board whether you were rebel or not large-scale asset loss large-scale capital loss and the steady disintegration of tribal cohesion now that's a a very short summary that gets us to the mid 1980s when New Zealand decides for the first time to confront that past and to do something about it. Significantly, I think, because the Māori population in the 80s had grown to more than 10%, much of it urban and increasingly radicalised. And New Zealand is a small uh, country, relatively intimate, it could not really afford a stone in its shoe that large and change had to be made. So the treaty settlement process was un began with the Waitangi Tribunal, uh, New Zealand's Truth and Reconciliation Tribunal, which had been established in 1975 and then in 1985, given retrospective jurisdiction to deal with the historical process of loss that I have talked about. It was the Waitangi Tribunal that first raised this idea of the treaty representing a partnership, a way of dodging the words of the treaty and the conflict between the words by, I guess, um, speaking to what it symbolized, speaking to the vibe of the document. The mainstream courts, when litigation went to court over the treaty settlement process in the 1980s, picked up this idea and ran with it so that it became not just the recommendatory musings of the Waitangi Tribunal that has no teeth, but statements of legal principle in respect of what the president of the Court of Appeal at the time said was the most important document in New Zealand history. And he said the Treaty of Waitangi represents a partnership between the races. So this idea kind of flourishes, if you like, um, tentatively at first, but more recently has received a bit of a shot in the arm. Now, I was thinking about how I would talk about um, this aspect, but I went back and looked through um, a report of the Waitangi Tribunal that I had something to do with that seemed to kind of articulate the things I wanted to say. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to read from page 14, 15, um, 14 and 15 of the Waitangi Tribunal's report on the Y262 claim, which is called Koaltearoa Tene, a, a claim about um, law and policy affecting Māori culture and identity, published in 2011. I think it's trying to capture the, the zeitgeist at the time. So that's why I thought it'd be easier and probably clearer if I just read this to you. It says, even after all this time, and this is in 2011, relations between Māori and non-Māori New Zealanders continue to test our collective comfort zones. We still seem to hear the burden, to bear the burden of mutually felt attitudes from our colonial past. Pākehā, that's uh, white New Zealanders, and now other New Zealanders fear that Māori will acquire undeserved privileges at their own expense. 
Some, though by no, no means all, would prefer that law and policy was completely blind to any culture that did not reflect the Western liberal values that travelled here with Captain Cook. Māori New Zealanders, on the other hand, are fearful that their unique place as First People will not be respected by other New Zealanders. They fear that the majority would prefer Māori was simply assimilated into an imagined utopian mainstream. Some Māori, though again by no means all, argue for an entirely separate Māori future in which the non-Māori majority no longer has a veto over their aspirations. Sometimes we forget that between these two poles, there is in fact a much larger degree of goodwill than New Zealanders give themselves credit for. Most non-Māori New Zealanders like the fact that Māori identity and culture is now a vital aspect of New Zealand identity and culture. In this way, we reject the old colonial label of Little Britain in the South Pacific and express our unique heritage. And most New Zealanders accept, perhaps even celebrate, the fact that their separate identity is now respected and expressed within New Zealand's sorry, most Māori New Zealanders accept, perhaps even celebrate, the fact that their separate identity is now respected and expressed within New Zealand's mainstream public institutions, rather than remaining in separate, wholly Māori institutions sitting at the margins of national life. Such a large area of common good can only have arisen from a solid base of mutual respect. This respect between Māori and Pākehā made possible the watershed treaty settlements process of the last 25 years. That process has been both a cause and a symptom of deep changes in our national makeup. It has been less than perfect in places, and it remains to be seen whether settlements will be big enough and adaptable enough to deliver the same optimism in the time of our mokobuna, our grandchildren, as it has for this current generation. It has, after all, been a very human experiment, experiment, and it would be strange indeed if we did not feel a measure of fear for our future success. Yet the national consensus over the need to address the wounds of the past is so strong that few would say the risk has not been worth taking. Nation building is nothing if not a constant work in progress, and after a generation and after a generation of hard work, New Zealand is beginning yet another transition. New Zealanders are unconsciously and organically building a new and unique national identity. It will, we suggest, come to be based on two things, the extraordinary naturally, natural beauty and wealth of these islands and the partnership between our two founding cultures. The first basis needs no explanation. The second basis is the human dimension of our identity. Māori culture locates us in the Pacific and gives us our deep roots here. Pākehā culture locates us at the same time in the West and gives us our right to the West's heritage, even though in physical terms at least, the West could hardly be further away. Bicultural fusion gives our vibrant multicultural reality a solid core with enough gravity to pull later immigrant cultures into orbit around its vision, its values and expectations. A nation cannot sustain itself without that solid core. Whether the transition succeeds will depend partly on another development. Over the next decade or so, the Crown Māori relationship, still currently fixed on Māori grievances, must shift to a less negative and more future-focused relationship at all levels. This change is expected and intended. It will reflect growing Māori confidence, driven from continued demographic change and settlement-based economic tribal economic renewal, and it will also provide a more positive platform for jointly addressing current Māori social problems. Will it be possible to normalise Crown Māori relations as the architects of the treaty settlement process intended? What, for that matter, 
might normal look like? New Zealand is unique among the post-colonial countries uh, with which we most often are compared in that our parliament, our courts, and the Waitangi Tribunal conceptualize the relationship between the Crown as the proxy for the state and Māori as a partnership. Other countries emphasize the great power of the state and the relative powerlessness of their indigenous peoples by placing state fiduciary or trust obligations at the center of domestic indigenous rights law. Not so New Zealand. Here we emphasize through the partnership symbol that our indigenous law is built on an original treaty consensus between formal equals. We do, of course, have our own protective principles that acknowledge the power asymmetry between Māori and the British Empire in 1840 and between Māori and the post-colonial state today. But while protecting the interests of a less powerful group is an objective of our treaty law, it is not the framework. Partnership is New Zealand's framework because our history since 1840 and the important role Māori play in, customary, in contemporary national life make it so. There is no sign that this role will diminish. On the contrary, the signs are that it will grow and the partnership framework will endure. It is evolving as New Zealand evolves. There are signs that is changing from the familiar late 20th century partnership built on the notion that the perpetrator's successor must pay the victim's successor for the original colonial sin into a 21st century relationship of mutual advantage in which through joint and agreed action, both sides end up better than they were before they started. This is the Treaty of Waitangi beyond grievance. So um, that's kind of the, the position that we've got to. And it's in that context that partnerships discussions are taking place in this country today. Partnership is a word that denotes sharing power and responsibility. To be fair, governments often forget about the power sharing bit and, ind and indigenous peoples tend to forget about the responsibility bit. But partnership is not consultation before the government makes a decision. Partnership is not indigenizing the public sector by putting more Indigenous people into it. Partnership is a mechanism that will operate at constitutional, policy and administrative levels in recognition of a series of things that are quite important, I think. First, in recognition that there's a pre-existing polity and legal order with which the state must engage for mutual advantage between that pre-existing order and the state. Partnership is not a discretionary concession to the needs of social justice, even if it may look that way. It is a mechanism to respond rationally to issues and challenges that both sides of the partnership share a sense of responsibility for addressing. One, as the colonial oppressor, needing to make room for the oppressed to heal and grow at last. One, as a modern government required to meet the needs of a specific community anyway. And the other, as a modern government with ancient attributes needing to meet the needs of its own community in order to survive and grow. Partnership is a mechanism for doing the hard work that must be done to move on from a traumatic past on indigenous terms, not on the assimilative white terms of the last hundred years or so. Partnership is not exclusive of self-determining mechanisms. And it's not exclusive of strategies for indigenizing the public sector, 
my experience is that all of these strategies run at the same time in a relatively untidy way, at least in this country. They tend to be organic rather than the subject of big statements. They tend to grow from the grass up rather than from the top down, at least in the beginning. Now, there are lots of, well, not lots, there are a few modern examples of partnerships in operation in this country. And I want to speak very briefly about those things before finishing off. How am I doing for time, by the way? Someone want to tell me that? You're, you're doing fine. Uh, officially, we've got 12 minutes left for this. Oh, that's session, nice. yep. but, um But we can extend as well, so don't feel constrained. Right. So uh, the partnership established between the Crown and the tribes of the Waikato River, the five tribes of the Waikato River, that led to the creation of the Waikato River Authority is a partnership model. Uh, that partnership model established the vision and strategy for the Waikato River. And all decision making below that, local authority at regional water distribution level and at uh, district council resource cons uh, land based consents and so on, are all subject to it. Uh, the Waikato River Authority is 50% Waikato tribes, five one represented for each of the five tribes, and 50% Crown. Underneath that are a series of what are called joint management agreements with local authorities, where the relevant tribe having what we would say mana or indigenous rights in the particular area uh, belong, joint management agreements with the local authority that are the kind of localized partnerships of those things. Now, uh, I have to say that when I started litigating in this area a long, long time ago now, the idea that this would happen was really unimaginable. And that's not to say that the model is perfect. There are lots of issues that are being worked through. But looking back 40 years, I would never have thought that there would be joint crown Māori management over New Zealand's largest uh, and most heavily used river. There is also the Wanganui River uh, version of that, uh, which you may know about because it starts with the recognition of the Wanganui River's um, personality, legal personality, and is often spoken of internationally for that reason. Uh, but there are a few things about that partnership model which um, really strike me as potentially quite powerful. Two people are what, for our purposes, I'll call the guardians of the river. They're called Botupua, uh, but let's call them guardians. You get the vibe of it. One appointed by the Crown and one appointed by um, the river tribes. That group uh, now let me just uh, let me just make sure I get this right. There's a three member advisory group known as the Karewao to support the two guardians, including representatives of iwi and relevant local authorities. And there is the Kopuka, a strategy group established for the river. This group must approve a thing called Te Heke Ngahuru, which is the planning, planning policy statement for the river. Now, this is a river which uh, has relatively significant hydroelectric installations on it. 
and entities exercising any powers under our environmental legislation, under our heritage legislation, and frankly, a whole pile of other acts, must have particular regard, it is said, to Te Heke Ngahuru, this policy document. Now, that all seems relatively straightforward, but what is kind of significant in this is how far the Whanganui tribes have gone to include everyone in the conversation. And it was their choice, I understand, to do this. It was their choice that the legislation should be all-encompassing rather than exclusionary so that the Whanganui tribes and the Crown would be the only players. So Te Pau Tupua is a Crown partnership. That's at the top level, the two guardians. Te Karewao is a partnership between the tribes and the local authorities. All local authorities on the river belong to the second level down the Kawerao, the, the, the Karewao. And below that, the Kōpuka, which also has approval power, has 17 members on it, representing all relevant stakeholders, tribes, local authorities, Department of Conservation, Fish and Game Council, Genesis, the hydroelectric uh, generator on the river, recreational tourism, and farming interests. So uh, what we see here is... Um, the creation through the Potupua of a simple partnership model in which the partners, and particularly the Māori side, which has tended in the past to be the one with least power, has undertaken this leap of faith that the quality of its leadership and its vision will be such that all stakeholders, including, to be honest, the traditional enemies of the iwi, including them, will buy into the strategy and vision. I think what they have in mind, and this is an aspect of partnerships that tends to get overlooked, is that their ideas are so good and so valuable, the tribal ideas, tribal values and tribal principles, are so good and so valuable that with a bit of education, the rest of the community will buy into them. In other words, you're getting a reverse colonization a reverse assimilation or reverse integration process going on. That's the design anyway. We'll see whether it ends up that way, but it's an extraordinary leap of faith that the tribes have decided that that's what they want it to be. Then there's the Urewera um, forest partnership in which the forest in the center of the North Island is also accorded legal personality and a crown Tuhoi, in that case, a Crown Tuhoi tribe uh, partnership table is created. Uh, we don't have time to go into the detail of that, but um, once again, those at the table are expressing confidence, perhaps quiet, perhaps careful, that through the conversation at the table, both sides can be transformed. And in particular, the Crown side and community representatives will come to stop seeing the Māori perspective as other, as alien, but as something that is normal and that incorporates a set of values, principles and understandings that make sense for that place. There's one other formal partnership um, mechanism that I want to mention, and that's Section 7AA of the Oranga Tamariki Act. Now, the Oranga Tamariki Act is the, um, I'm not sure what your legislation is called, but this is the legislation, this is the child welfare legislation, uh, pursuant to which um, the government uh, imposes care and protection orders uh, on children, or the court uh, at the behest of the government imposes care and protection orders on children and facilitates their removal if there is uh, concern about the, the safety of the child. So this is one of the areas where 
I've said New Zealand has performed extraordinarily badly in terms of the removal of Māori children from their families. Um, and I just wanted to mention uh, the way Section 7AA makes it compulsory for the chief executive of that agency called Oranga Tamariki to engage with Māori over, uh, in a partnership format over the work that that agency does. So it requires the chief executive to establish strategic partnerships with iwi, with tribes, in respect of the work of that agency. And it says if uh, an iwi or a Māori organisation uh, invites the chief executive to enter into a strategic partnership, then the chief executive must respond, must consider and respond to any such invitation, and must report to Parliament on the progress being made with respect to strategic partnerships. Now, obviously, this, this is designed structurally to walk tribes and Māori organisations into the courtroom where decisions are getting made, into the agency where decisions are getting made about the children belonging to those tribes and those communities. So uh, you can see why, given uh, the way the numbers operate, why the parliament would consider this is a powerful, a potentially powerful way of stopping or slowing the uh, loss of Māori children to their whānau, their extended families, and to their iwi, their tribes. All right, so that's a new one put in place in 2019. Um, we still don't know where it's going to get to, but the words are powerful. Sometimes words don't matter. If the money isn't there or the attention isn't there, but the words are there anyway, and so uh, require some level of attention. I just wanted to mention one other that's um, one other partnership style of model, which is uh, being advanced by the chief district court judge, Judge Hemi Tomonu, which he calls Te Ao Marama, which in Māori means the world of light. Uh, and he, uh, with a great deal of support from his bench, wants to change the way in which criminal justice is done at that district court level, so, which would be, I would say, 90, 95% of New Zealand's criminal justice work, both in processing to uh, plea or verdict and in sentencing. And once again, his aim, with the support uh, of the government and the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Corrections and the police, wants to bring the tribes into the courtroom to engage in the process of caring for their members who are in the court and present the court with other options, in a sense to take back power over their particularly younger offenders in partnership with the court, at least at a structural level. Now again, this has really just been rolled out and it's not, uh, it's too early to know whether uh, change will result, but it is yet another technique, if you like, for shifting Māori from the outside of power to the table of power and stopping Māori being seen as other. And in doing so, and this is, has always been the effect in my experience, changing the institution or the person on the other side of the table in the process. So partnerships impact on both sides. Partners learn from each other and they change. They come to respect the modalities of the other side and to see those modalities 
as normal, not alien. This is a subtle process and it takes time, but in my experience, that has been the effect in more cases than it has not. I want to give you one story um, to show how this can develop organically. Now, this is a this is a court story, so bear with me. About a decade ago, the district court, which is you know the primary uh, the court that sees most people, if you like, in uh, this country, decided that it wanted to open and close court in Māori. Given the high proportion of Māori, particularly in the criminal justice and child welfare areas engaged with that court, this was a way of uh, trying, kind of ham-fistedly really, to reflect the culture of those people in what the court does and what was otherwise it might be said, an intensely white institution. So the court crier would say, te tukua, silence all stand for their honour, the judge. And at the end of the day, the person would say, kua te kaifakawa, e tukua. Uh, his or her honour will retire, please stand. And uh, court criers throughout the country were trained in how to do this. And when the senior courts decided to follow suit about a year or two later, I was a high court judge and I went around the country training the registrars, it was fun actually, training the registrars to deliver these lines um, in a way that didn't butcher them too badly. Well, and that proceeded and appeared symbolic, even token. But then the prosecutors, the Crown prosecutors, decided that uh, they should really get on board. Partly, I think, because of the steady indigenizing of the public sector and Crown law being an agency within the public sector, feeling that it needed to do its bit. So we got Crown counsel appearing particularly at appellate level, but in everywhere where Crown Counsel appeared, uh, from the Crown Law Office at least, standing up and saying, tēnā koutou e ngā kaiwhakawā ko Williams taku i ngō e tuanau mo te karauna. Greetings, uh, Your Honours, uh, if it's a multi-judge bench. My name is Williams and I appear for the Crown. And this happened first at a pallet level and then spread throughout the country. And, and then um, firms with the Crown Warrant decided that they'd better catch up. So they started doing it too. And then the defence bar got embarrassed in the criminal area at least because the Crown Prosecutor or the appellate Crown or the respondent Crown had stolen a march on them in terms of the moral high ground, so the defence bar decided that they would run some programmes to learn how to say what they needed to say in Māori as well as in English. And then by this time I was in the Court of Appeal, uh, the judges started to feel a little self-conscious about all this Māori being spoken before the business of the court starts, and them not being able to reply so they asked me um, what were appropriate lines to deliver and I ended up teaching judges in the senior courts at least and um, Judge Tomau who did the same in the district court how they might respond with things like tēnā, tēnā koe or tēnā koru if there's two of them uh, greetings to you both no mai te koti, uh, te koti matua welcome to the high court or whatever you would say and so I hadn't kind of noticed the shift until one day I walked into court in the Court of Appeal as the junior judge, so I had no speaking role. Uh, and for the first three, four minutes, almost no English was spoken. The 
process was run in Māori or largely in Māori. And I was the only Māori in the courtroom and the only person in the courtroom who spoke Māori. And I hadn't said a word. And it made me think that something quite fundamental had subtly shifted. If the system should feel for its own legitimacy, for its own moral underpinning, that it should go this far with respect to the introduction of my ancestral language into its operation. And there was a case in 1978 called Mihaka and the Police in which Mr. Mihaka argued that he should be able to argue his case in Māori and receive translations of all that was going on in Māori, even though Mr. Mihaka spoke English. The judge who dealt with that application in 1978 said uh, in a judgment that was reported that the language of the courts in New Zealand is English and it has been since 1362, which is a little interesting. But it related to the reign of Edward II, I think. There must have been a, an act passed to stop French being spoken, I suspect. But in any event, that was the law in 1978, and it remained the law for a long time. But my point is, no judge engaged in the modern way in which the Maori language is woven into the court's processes today would ever have written that judgment. And that's an important shift. The idea of partnership creates that kind of mutual respect or striving for mutual respect, which is the precondition to achieving real self-determination and real mana for Indigenous peoples anywhere in the world. Sir Joe Williams, Honourable Justice of the Supreme Court of New Zealand, thank you very much for that thought-provoking address on the journey of the, the treaty in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and where it's headed for future generations. And, and thank you for your obvious commitment to, to getting Mary a better deal. I know earlier you were worried that people would be laughing or, or grimacing or, or squirming. Well, I don't think you had to worry about that at all. And uh, virtually, of course, uh, given this is the format of the conference, a big virtual round of applause uh, to you for that uh, wonderful keynote address. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our first session. You can hear more from Justice Williams, who's been very generous with his time in our yarning circles that start at uh, half past one uh, Sydney time, half past three Auckland time uh, today, where you'll get a chance to ask him more about what he spoke about just then. So if you have an idea that sprang to mind or a question that you thought of during that address, don't forget it. Write it down in the short break between these sessions and uh, have it ready to go when uh, you join that yarning circle uh, in just under an hour's time. We are going to move now though to panel number two. And again, moving virtually in this session requires you to click back to timeline on the top left of your screen, back to timeline, that magic button, and then join uh, the, uh, the next panel session. If you have any difficulties, of course, live support is there on the top right of your screen. I'm going to do that now. I'll see you in the panel discussion in a minute or so.